Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you here in the theater in America, House Munich, and to those of you joining us online as well from wherever you are, I'd like to give you a warm welcome um, to our evening about the politics of U.S. information warfare. I'm Bartley Grosser Richter, and coming up on five years ago, a few of us in the Yale Club of Munich had the idea to start Munich Dialogues on Democracy. And a friend of mine who's here tonight suggested that I come meet with Dr. Zwingenberger here at America House to pitch the idea for a cooperation. How lucky are we that America House was immediately on board and as our partner can generously host us in this gorgeous space. So I'd like to start by thanking the team here, especially Dominic Rabe and Lisa in the program uh, division, and uh, of course the ever-fantastic tech team in the back who do such a fantastic job and uh, make hybrid in-person and live stream look so easy. So can we say thank you? So welcome in the name of America House Munich, the history of which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about tonight because it actually fits in with our theme. And welcome in the name of the Yale Club of Germany and to any Yaleys who are with us tonight. There is a bit of a Yale connection tonight, so bear with me as I take you around a few corners. I have subscribed to and I'm following a fantastic online Substack class called the Freedom Academy with Asha Rangappa. Asha is a lawyer, a former FBI special agent, and a senior lecturer at Yale. She teaches uh, national security law and information warfare at Yale's Jackson School. So the first guest lecture for her class was given by our guest tonight, Matt Armstrong. I found it fascinating, and when I found out that he was in Zurich, I thought, that's not so far away, maybe we could entice him to come. And I am very pleased that he agreed to come and be with us tonight, and I hope you enjoy what he has to say as much as I did. So not only did he agree to give a talk tonight, he told me that he enjoys working with students. So we were able to have the entire 11th grade of the Munich International School here at America House today for workshops with Matt. And so I'd also like to welcome those of you from the MIS community um, who stuck around and are still here <laughs> or watching online. I know there is a um, university info abend at the school tonight, so the students are going to look at colleges. Um, but I look forward to hearing maybe from you in the Q&A section if you have any more input about what you learned today or have any more questions. So all the way back in 1959, there was testimony in the US Congress to the spread of communism. This I have from the, uh, the Freedom Academy, Asha's substack. Historian Stacy Cohn describes the testimony about how communists use organized persuasion and mass propaganda to win people subtly and slowly in great numbers to their side. Freedom of political thought and speech were hallmarks of democracy, but the communists were insidiously turning both into vehicles whereby freedom's enemy could render democracy vulnerable while remaining invisible during the attack. That was 1959. Last week, you might have seen the front page article in the New York Times about Eastern Ukraine. Um, I included a bit of it in the last email that went out if you're on our list. It was about how after years of propaganda, some there actually support the Russian invaders. The local police chief said um, he attributes the view of civilians largely to the relentless uh, and insidious Russian propaganda campaign that has been directed at the local population for over a decade. It's turning them against their own government, and he said, quote, in my opinion, it's the most brutal weapon the Russian Federation uses on our people. So our speaker tonight is an expert on US public diplomacy and political warfare. We talk quite a bit about how Russia and China wield information warfare, I mean, we live it. But Matt's gonna talk to us about the history behind um, United States propaganda and why he thinks we're bad at it, and current challenges given both the domestic and the geopolitical situation. A bit about Matt, he's currently pursuing a PhD at King's College London on the US responses to Russian political warfare in the early Cold War. He was previously nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate to serve from 2013 to 2017 as governor on the Broadcasting Board of Governors. He's also served as the executive director of the US Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. For nearly two decades, he has worked with the Defense Department, the State Department, Congress, 
NATO organizations, and ministries of NATO member countries on issues related to the U.S. government's international information activities. He's testified several times before congressional committees, including the House Armed Services Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee, always about gray zone activities and information warfare. And he's particularly proud to have been sanctioned by Russia in 2022. <laughs> so after Matt speaks, we will have time to take your questions. As always, we'll be using Slido. So in the theater, if you just hold your phone up and scan the code, then you put in hashtag America House and you can type your questions. And for you at home, just go to slido.com, hashtag America House, and type in your questions. And we will try to bundle them and get to as many as we can in the about hour that we have together tonight. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming to Munich, Matt Armstrong. Thanks. Well, I feel like there's uh, even more pressure than there was before with students coming back and, and that uh, set up. So um, thank you, Bartley. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, America House. Thank you, everybody, for that's, uh, that's here uh, in person and online. Um, I hope I live up at least partially to the expectation. Um, the, just to speak, go back a little bit to what was just said about the Freedom Academy, what's funny is that... Um, when I saw Asha have Freedom Academy on there and I saw this, I thought this is really interesting because nobody has really seen this before. It's actually a fundamental part of my PhD research. It's actually an example, the creation, the, the whole not narrative around this thing that you've probably never heard of despite it being a significant activity in the United States and being broadly aware communities across the country wanting to know more about it, Gallup polls showing that there was a high degree of uh, awareness. In fact, at one point, 70 percent, they wanted the legislation to pass. But it was completely absent from the Cold War uh, literature. Why? Because it didn't fit the narrative. Because the act, some of these activities are just absent from Cold War history uh, discussions, which is just quite fascinating, which is some of what is going to anchor my discussion today. I do want to say a couple of things, though, is that um, Asha's reference or source for Freedom Academy is quite interesting because that historian argues that Freedom Academy was about suppressing domestic speech, which is not what it was about. So it's interesting when we get in these narratives and you actually pick apart these things. And the other is, I wouldn't use the term propaganda because that's a unique English word that to use it may be an act of it. Say something is propaganda, it may very well be an act of propaganda. So, personally, I find it's a very complicated word and, and try to avoid the term. So, um, you're not going to hear me talk about it. I will refer to, I will mention, I'll respond to the terms and, uh, and whatnot. But just uh, a couple of things about that. So, to start with, and I'm going to try to be brief, and I may even abbreviate what I've already prepared because my preferences have the conversation. The Q&A is more important. I can throw stuff at you and say, this is what I want you to know, but I really want to hear what you're thinking, what your questions are, and to have a discussion about that. So that's going to be my preference here. So to start, the politics of U.S. information warfare, what, the stuff that we call public diplomacy, why do we do it? Well, there's a reason, and it's not a recent issue. The reason is to counter disinformation, correct misinformation, and fill in the gaps in the absence of information. Ultimately, that's the purpose. That's why legislation was passed to uh, authorize these activities, starting with the introduction of this legislation in 1945, before the war was actually over in uh, either Europe or Japan, for that matter. And its, it's basis is, is really that the people the elements of culture and the media of economic existence, existence idea, and ideas are moving around the world with a freedom never before matched in history. Basically, the idea is modern international relations are between people, not just governments. And so the people, the public opinion matters in the conduct and success of foreign policy. And that's why we got into this stuff. And there's some element, I think, that gets lost. Whoops, where did we go? Oh, I was already on that slide is telling our story. Why do we tell our story? What does telling our story mean? And this was a, con a topic of conversation in speaking with the students today, which was uh, enjoyable, so it's, it's nice to see some back. Maybe they didn't get enough or what have you. Why do we tell our story? Well, the idea today 
I think is different than what it was then. Then it was to counter disinformation, correct misinformation, and all that stuff. So for example, the idea was, why are we doing these policies? What are our policies? And what are the objectives? And who are we as a people that want to do this? And that was telling our story. That has been lost to a degree, however. So, um, one thing I'm going to skip and we can come back to if you want is the uh, op-ed by Robert Gates, former Secretary of Defense. Um, I'm going to pass that just to get into the QA. So, the idea here of why we tell our story involves exchanges, involves informational activities, whether it's libraries, whether it's facilitating and paying for, enabling, um, sending personnel to support and converse in entities like America House or libraries. Um, the United States Information Service, uh, prior to World War II, through World War II, and after World War II, long before the U.S. Information Agency was created, was doing this type of stuff. Providing books, providing magazines and newspapers, providing speakers. There was a, there was a sharing of not just educational folks, university professors, university students, but teachers, but people expert in um, um, census taking, expert in agricultural science, to create the shared relationship, to build capacity locally. And we did this as part of an idea because who we are, what we are is important, and because we need these other countries to have capacity and have capabilities as well. And broadly, the information program was cheap. And I want to step back and just reiterate, the information program was not just nouns and verbs. It was not just, let's put a broadcast on the Voice of America and send it abroad. It was having a conversation. It was understanding what is going on abroad, what's going on in the uh, conversations, what are we attempting to achieve, we in, as the United States in this case, obviously. So it's not expensive. So if you see this, it's, it's uh, by the way, I include the Omar Bradley quote. I've got one from Nimitz. I've got quotes from General Eisenhower. It's all over the place. But the idea is that even the military side says, you know, this stuff is, not a, is, is tremendously important. So we have some relevance. There's some connections between then, then being uh, the 1940s, post-war environment, and today. And the need was we need authorization. We need these legislative authorities to create these operations to engage abroad. Because if we don't tell our story, somebody else will. Okay, so we have a challenge. I'm going to actually uh, skip these because this talks about USIA and I'm going to just save time on that. So the idea is how do we engage? Well. Talking about some of the history, the U.S. foreign policy in the early Cold War starts to become militarized. And the focus is less on the informational component and more on the militarization of it. And so this is actually what comes where the Freedom Academy ideas come out. Because in the 50s, there's an idea that, hey, we're amateurs. We have people going abroad, and we are unable to anticipate and react to foreign advers adversarial political warfare waged against our interests. The European Recovery Program was ultimately a psychological operation. That's, those are George Kennan's own words in a confidential memo that he wrote a month after George Marshall announced what became known as the Marshall Plan. It was about the Europeans pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. In fact, Kennan's memo, in his memo, he says, look, nobody else helped me write this. It's all me. Don't blame staff. Um, and if Congress finds out how we're structuring this, they're not going to be happy because they're going to say there's a cheaper way to do it and it's right. But this is the correct way to do it. But it's ultimately a PSYOP. But we can't tell the Europeans a PSYOP because then it's just not going to be effective. So you have policies integrated with informational components. In fact, the quote that I gave from Munt just a moment ago, this was a congressman saying, hey, this, hey Senate, get off your butt, enact this legislation because the European Recovery Program, which was announced and not even active yet, is getting hammered. The Soviets actually reorganized their propaganda operations, there I use the word, to be more effective here. So, I want to go through the history because I want to get in the conversations here. So, we have 
situation where we are focused on the military side, the deterrent side. And that creates something of a Maginot line. Now that's an interesting idea, that if you create this military deterrence and you are holding, creating a threshold of action, what are your other options? In fact, the idea that nuclear deterrence is a kind of Maginot line so that it can be easily bypassed, often by political warfare, which today is often conceived or described as gray zone warfare, sometimes even hybrid warfare, although that doesn't really fit, even information warfare. It's an interesting concept. I think the Maginot Line idea is even more interesting since Henry Kissinger wrote it in 1955, that there is a challenge here. I think he then evolved in his thinking on how he approached this. But the idea is we need to have a full set of tools, and we were bringing that tool set down. And so the idea of this uh, Freedom Academy idea to train American government officials, those involved with creating programs, implementing programs, um, civil society leaders who were engaged with unions or other targets of, of Russian communist uh, uh, information activities, influence activities, subversion, um, as well as allied nations and allied uh, government officials, allied um, uh, civil society, was you want to know what the enemy's tactics are. If you don't know what their tactics are, you're not sure what they're going to do, so you can't anticipate it, so you're constantly reactive. You're unable to preempt. You're unable to uh, even pivot quickly. And so that was, that was ultimately the idea of the Freedom Academy. Now, it died because of bureaucratic fighting, which is a theme that we're going to continue to see, particularly in our conversations. Uh, I'm sure in the Q&A it's going to come up. So this gets into, okay, where are we today? Well, we have this really difficult concept of why do we engage abroad? Why? What is the purpose? What is telling our story? Telling our story is, hey, why do they, don't li why do they not like us? Why do they hate us? Well, I just want to tell you about me. Why, why, do, you want, why do they want to know about me? I, what is, we've lost the telling your story part. To the, um, and I'm, I'm, there are exceptions to the rule, and there are some very good activities that are done, so I don't want to be uh, wholly negative there. But so... Did anybody read the Gates article, for example, the, the Robert Gates op-ed that was uh, just over a week ago, appeared in the Washington Post? The very interesting thing about that article is that he opens, <laughs> he opens up, I'm sorry for laughing, is he opens up with the line that none of this is really important because military deterrence is the, is the most important thing. And then he says, but there's, there's these other things which is a really fascinating statement, because as I spoke with the uh, MIS students today, the U.S. has a quite massive military budget, right? How many countries below combined equate to the U.S. budget? Plus, the U.S. has an unmatched ability to deliver, project uh, combat capabilities, whether warheads or troops, around the world. No, no country can match the United States in that. So if military, de military deterrence was the whole thing, why are we having this conversation? Why do the cottage industries around gray zone, around, around hybrid warfare, around information warfare, why are they even there if military deterrence was actually it? It's because we've, we've stripped away all our other toolkits and we have this threshold for action, which for domestic politics is, increasing, is always going to be challenging whether it lowers, whether it rises, whether the, some one situation or another situation makes it easier to uh, conduct a military activity, that's going to be a, a variable of the moment. But because we are so stripped of our capabilities, which I would argue go back to really the 50s, um, something fall? Sorry, I got distracted. Okay. <laughs> I thought my mic fell. Sorry about that. Um, how unprofessional of me for doing that. Um, um, that we don't have a full toolkit. We don't understand. And you have these conversations about asymmetric warfare as well, which I loved hearing during uh, uh, the Iraq war, for example, or in Afghanistan. Oh, my gosh, the enemy is fighting is asymmetrically. They're not fighting. Okay, in any sort of situation, let's say you're, you're playing sports. And the opposing player, or the, te the team has weak players. Are you going to ignore those weak players? 
or are you going to exploit the fact that those players are weak in trying to score? You're going to exploit them. You're going to exploit that weakness. And that's what we're seeing in these conversations about hybrid warfare, uh, uh, gray zone warfare. And you see conversations where it's, okay, it's, it's, okay, it's out of the peace. So it's gray zone, which is between, keyword, between war and peace. Well, peace is where you're supposed to be defending. That's where you're supposed to be active. And I just want to throw one other point about this, is that organizations, various organizations within the UN and various others, are, were actually, from the US point of view, established to deny these activities, these adversarial activities. And one point, I should have included this quote, because this is actually one of the most important quotes. If you look at the UNESCO preamble, the, the preamble to the UNESCO Constitution, in the minds of men, war starts, and so in the minds of men, the defenses shall begin, something like that. I've, I've done a terrible job. The words actually came from Prime Minister uh, Adley, UK Prime Minister Adley, and it was adapted to the Constitution. In the minds of men, the idea of UNESCO was originally an information, education, scientific exchange organization. It was a freedom of information, a freedom of communication, a freedom of engagement organization. There are certain countries that don't like any of that, and that was the idea. This was, if you will, a public diplomacy operation of a, a supranational organization to support little d democratic principles. You're not going to hear me say supporting democracy because I don't know what that means. Whose democracy is it? German, Japanese, English, American? I don't know. It's all about the principles of freedom and it's how you want to govern and all that sort of stuff. And so we've lost sight. So we set up these international organizations. Okay, so now we don't, we don't understand why we did that and we've lost sight and we lost control of them in some cases. And on the informational side, on the engagement side, we have forgotten why we have activities. We forgot why do we have an informational component. We have forgotten why do we, why do we tell our story. So I want to share something that actually came up this evening um, after I was meeting with the students, went back to the hotel room to rest, checking my email, and in a conversation with a colleague, um, he shared something. So uh, I'm going to strip this of identifying information, but in the early days, so he was working in the uh, Defense Department, U.S. Defense Department, during, and during the early days of uh, the U.S. presence in Iraq, he recommended taking out a full-page ad in Al Jazeera listing all of the initiatives the U.S. had taken and accomplished to make life better for the Iraqis. Makes sense. Here are the things we are doing. Let's, we can have a conversation about the good things we're doing. That doesn't mean you can't talk about the bad things. There's a whole bunch of issues with that. But here are the things we're doing. So remember, why did this legislation, these programs get established in the first place? To help the Marshall Plan. Because what we're doing, why we're doing it, needed to be understood and known because it was being distorted. Okay. At the time, Al Jazeera was the CNN of Iraq, Coalition, Provi Coalition Provisional Authority, remember that? That was a long time ago. Populated with State Department folks, shot down the idea. Because, I was told, it was too much like propaganda. So you can't communicate. So this gets into institutional challenges. These aren't necessarily policy issues. These are the culture of bureaucracy issues. So talking about the politics, this falls into that category. Why aren't we good at it? Some of it has to do, a good deal surprisingly has to do with barriers in the, within the bureaucracies, shutting down conversations, starting shutting down avenues of approach. But it reminded me of, of another example that I'd heard many, many years ago, where it was the, the Brits. Do you remember the, um, the, the phrase, battle for hearts and minds? I would love to see a dissertation, master's, PhD, I don't care, on how that phrase shaped U.S. foreign policy. Right? Why? Because these activities are not a battle. A battle is something you win or lose. It's like a sports match. And it's not about hearts. It doesn't matter if you like something. The phrase that was used in the early Cold War was a struggle for minds and wills. A struggle is something that's ongoing, it's an enduring. Somebody else can be involved. You've got two parties, they settle it, but then somebody else comes in and pulls the tug of war rope and causes struggle. And it's minds and wills. You're trying to affect the will to act. 
So keep that in mind. Here's my story from the British. They find a bomb maker in probably the Helmand province of Afghanistan. They uh, capture him. Hey, dude, why are you making bombs? I am trying to make enough money to move my family and me to the United States. I would say the U.S. won his heart. Yeah. How, so how are we conceiving of our policies? How are we conceiving what tomorrow looks like and how our policies are going to work? What is the purpose? So um, I'm going to close because it's almost half hour. And I, like I said, I really prefer the engagement piece of it. I'm going to close with another quote. Now, this quote comes from 1947 as well, but it goes to the point about why do you have an information program? We may avert starvation in Europe. So remember 1947, well remember, know that in 1947 not only was the infrastructure just destroyed, damaged, but there were, had been a severe winter, severe drought, there were food scarcity, security issues, energy scarcity, uh, supply issues. We may avert help avert a starvation in Europe and aid in producing a generation of healthy, physically fit individuals whose bodies are strong but whose minds are poisoned against America and whose loyalties are attached to the Red Star of Russia. This is my favorite part. If we permit this to eventuate, it will be clear that our generosity, that the generosity of America is excelled by our own stupidity. So we may do these activities but why are we doing these activities? Going back up to the Dodd quote. If we don't have a collective, if we don't understand the policy. So I guess close before I say I'm actually done and we sit down, is if you read the Gates article, what was missing? There were two significant defects of his op-ed. And I thought his op-ed was very good. But the bar is very low in this category. But it was, it was, it was very good. Um, so besides him saying militarization, the militarization of policy is the most important thing, the second thing is he talked nothing about policy and the need to synchronize, link up, associate the informational element with the policy element. Policies need to be able to speak for themselves, not be distracted, distracted by or uh, uh, changing the subject with an information policy. So that's part of our challenge today. This is part of the politics. Now, I know a lot of what I just said was abstract and I'm happy to get into more details and further conversation, but I like to spark the discussion and get you thinking so that we can have uh, a, a nice conversation about these things. So that's my opening statement, presentation, and thank you for listening. Thank you. So, do I just swipe? Yes. Okay, so you can go to slido.com if you have any questions. Um, and I'm gonna open with um, something that you said a few weeks ago, because I just love the quote and I would like you to discuss it. Um, For most of the 20th century, our public diplomacy has been about changing the subject or putting lipstick on a pig. We need a policy that can stand up. We need to define our policies, not let Russia say what we are doing. You want to expand on that? So, so much of what we do, how our policies are configured, we, the United States, is reactive. There's some things that are proactive, but when we're talking about the big stuff, again, like the Robert Gates article, we're reactive. What do we want tomorrow to look like? My master's thesis, um, which was 2004, was... Um, which, by the way, did not come right after my undergraduate, my graduation from high school, just in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> the uh, opening line was, US, American public diplomacy wears combat boots, 2004, because the U.S. was essentially leading with the military. That was the, the tip of the spear of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. creating U.S. perceptions abroad. And so the public diplomacy side, and I'm using that term loosely because that's also another term I don't like because that was a term that was crafted for bureaucratic fighting in D.C. in the 60s. It's and a little it, more positive, though. Than what? Propaganda. I would just say public affairs, information. Yeah. But even in the 1960s, the term propaganda needed a qualifier. And this is why Edmund Goulian, who was the founder of the Tough School, uh, I'm sorry, he was the first director of the... 
uh, uh, Edward R. Murrow Center of Public Diplomacy at the uh, Univers Tufts University, he said, I'd rather call it propaganda, but that's because of his generation, propaganda was a neutral term. It needed a qualifier, good propaganda, bad propaganda, our propaganda, their propaganda. It was not an inherently negative term. So going back to the quote, the informational side of our activities, the public diplomacy, was um, understaffed, under-resourced. You had great people who are often doing great things despite the system, lacking leadership, la again, lacking resources, uh, lacking number of people, and it was, by definition, often reactive because it was so ill-supported. Um, and the directive would often be changing the subject, or it would be, let's talk about this because we don't want to be talking about the something else. Okay. I'm trying to bundle these. There are a couple that sort of come at the same thing. So. Isn't America's biggest problem that depending on an election every four years, we can give the world completely different answers as to what's important to us, or how do you see content continuity behind all of the noise? So that's a good question. I, I want to abstract it a little bit, and the part of the challenge is what do we want tomorrow to look like? And yes, every administration is going to change their policies and they're going to change their approach to foreign policy. And that will create friction and drag onto, okay, what are we communicating? How are we communicating it? But ultimately, are we connecting the information policy, informational activities, the engagement activities? This is where I like the, the Gates op-ed doesn't talk about information, they're talk, he, he talks about engagement. These engagement activities aren't, um, that not all of them have to be linked to the specific policies. For example, you'll want to create scientific engagement, um, various educational engagements, various technical engagements, um, provide access to what's going on in the U.S., not based on a particular administration's approach to, say, NATO. Uh, but, yeah. Part of that challenge is you, you did have an administration that was really insular and didn't care about the outside. Yeah. Um, but there are still activities. But again, you have, so if we move that aside, we still have a trend line of failing to support why we engage abroad and, and those resources that are necessary to engage abroad, which implies, if not, ex if not explicitly states, the informational side is simply not important. It sounds like from the conversations that we had today and, my, and conversations that you and I have had, that the problem is that our government doesn't get it. Yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> so, this, so back to the Gates article, he had some weird numbers in there, which I didn't, didn't quite understand. So, the under, so there's a position called the Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy. Um, it actually is public diplomacy and public affairs, but it's, let's just call it public diplomacy. And that position was established in 1999 with the abolishing of the United States Information Agency, and the position is essentially the replacement for the U.S. Information Agency director position. That position, this undersecretary, which is not a low-level position, it's the it, an undersecretary of the State Department, <coughs> has not have it, had a confirmed official sitting there for... 46% of the days. So imagine you're in a corporation, and let alone a government agency, and the head of the operation is absent. Nearly, let's just round it down, more than four days every week. And even when they're there, the tenure has only been, the median tenure was uh, 17 months. So they're not even in office that long. And they rotate out. So what kind of leadership is exercised? Okay, that's one thing. What type of leadership is exercised? <clears throat> what does the absence, the failure to appoint somebody, what message does that, does that send to the operations that are trying to do these activities? What message does that, does that send to the entire government 
that is looking for, hey, I need an informational element here, I need an engagement element here, or I need to look to somewhere besides the Defense Department. The Defense Department wants to look to the State Department. Now, the Defense Department has looked to various undersecretaries and said, hey, let's do something together. For example, there was one undersecretary, Jim Glassman, whose tenure was six months or eight months, something like that, which was abbreviated he was nominated and then he sat because two senators were having a fight over the Tennessee Valley Authority, which talk about politics get local. So this leader doesn't get in, but once he gets into the position, he goes to the, all the government agencies and says, hey, I will lead. I usually use the Pied Piper example, but that creates a false, a wrong analogy, uh, imagery there. But everybody sought a leader and they all came to Jim. I'm like, hey, let's activate this. And then you had subs, uh, subsequent people and they rejected that idea. In fact, you had one undersecretary that said, I don't need a DOD liaison. I don't need Defense Department liaison. I don't need somebody in my office to help me engage with the Def Defense Department. Then you had the Defense Department come back and say to the successor, to the next successor, hey, let's create a relationship. Nah, we don't need that. I'm and having so, a right to your congressperson moment. <laughs> Well, should we all like write our Congress people, Americans? They're anyway. absent from the conversation as well. But maybe they need to be made aware. I think that was a, perp a, a purpose of the Gates op-ed. Yes. But if they were interested, because this gets into the other piece of the militarization of U.S. foreign policy, is that uh, I've joked that there are three things that American knows is going to happen in life. Death, taxes, and the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the congressional authority to for the Defense Department. And the NDAA is, also, is always quite extensive because it's the uh, oversight committees, Senate Armed Services Committee, House Armed Services Committee, and then also the appropriators, um, really getting into detail. Here are the things you may do, Defense Department. And this last year, was it? Or maybe has time flown and it's two years ago. Congress finally, for the first time in about 20 years, passed a State Department authorization bill. Now, they passed one a bunch of years ago that was more of a fake document. It was like 10 pages. It wasn't a real author. It was okay. more of a thing. So you don't have that oversight. So when I was a member of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, so I'm a senior government official of a minor agency, relatively, but mid-level agency, I would even call it. It's not like I was a secretary or anything like that. Um, and I would meet with members of Congress on the oversight committees. And so BBG, Broadcasting Board of Governors, was in charge of, had underneath it, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, Office Cuba Broadcasting, a massive internet freedom, information freedom element to penetrate the digital firewalls that Gates referred to. Um, quite an amazing program, actually, quite, quite fascinating and interesting. And, and I would meet with these members of Congress, and I would get, so Voice of America is still operating? You're the oversight. You're supposed to know and you're supposed to grill me and complain of how it's not doing its stuff, why is it doing that and all that, and you're wondering it's actually functioning? So there's a, a severe lack of attention. Now, the State Department of the Foreign Affairs side, so it's not BBG, Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is now the U.S. Agency for Global Media, um, State Department doesn't have jets to fly people on, doesn't have things to go boom, doesn't have aircraft carriers to put people on, and, and these tangible things. It's a very intangible world that the, for, the U.S. Foreign Ministry deals with, which I think is part of the challenge. And in I testifying before a House Armed Services Committee once, I had one member of Congress say, good luck with that PR stuff, Matt, and then he goes back into trying to talk about more hard stuff, yeah. Yeah, so the... That's not to say there aren't members of Congress, Senate, and House that aren't interested in this stuff. It's not a lot, and certainly not as many that are interested in what fighter platform, what artillery platform, what's, what's the VA going to do even, those type of things. You just don't have that same level of interest and that same level of discourse. Okay, I'm going to take it out a little bit. One of the most popular question here is um, sort of undergirding what you just said. How can and should the average American or EU citizen contribute to pro-freedom progress in the context of information policy? It does, like I said, it feels like what, what can we do? Yeah. Um, I, the first thing I would say is media. So you're talking about citizen engagement, and I would focus on things like media literacy, trying to get your friends and colleagues and f family to understand 
um, and uh, pay attention to sources of information. So I'm old enough to remember, as well as most people here, a cartoon that was in New Yorker, I think? And it's two dogs at a computer. <laughs> yeah. No one knows you're a dog on the internet. And I've had to explain that cartoon to various audiences, which makes me feel old at times. Um, and it's true. And at one time, that was a derogative statement, right? It was, it was making fun of, yeah, you don't know who you're listening to. Don't listen to it. And today, it's almost, for some people, a badge of honor. I heard it on the internet. That was bad. Now it's good in some quarters. So I would say at the citizen level, individual level, it is evaluating these sources and holding people accountable. Man, you're listening to this? Where did you read that? No, let's have a discussion. How is that absurd? How is that false? Oh, this is interesting. Let's have a conversation about that. And that's at, at, this, at the personal level. And, I, and sometimes that's really difficult. I, I know it's difficult because I have family the same idea. Yeah. And it's... it's but it's really for the future of our societies. Now, as for an American, I think there's another challenge too, because living in Switzerland, I love the data privacy stuff. This is great. So on one example would be when Russia was playing their games in France, didn't really work, because they didn't have access to personal information. And this is more of a documented case. That's why I'm referring to France. I'm sure it, the same thing happened in Germany and, and Switzerland as well and all this. When was this? Uh, 2016, 2018. Okay. It was around that, between okay. 16 and 20. Okay. Um, and, um, but of course, the U.S., people, Americans are afraid of the government having their information, but they don't care about the corporations and the fact that anybody can go buy and sell extremely personal and minute data about an individual. And so you have corporations, entities, companies, corporations sound big, but entities that can just buy and sell and get in. And so for an American, I would say you press for privacy laws. You know, I, keep my, I have eSIM on, my, US, uh, on my, my Swiss phone, and I keep the U.S. number off. Why? Because I get all sorts of spam. Text messages, phone calls, it's just really frustrating. Mm. I am not looking back forward to going back to the U.S. because of, in part, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I have three people who want to know how can the U.S. have a coherent, integrated message to the rest of the world when it doesn't exist within the country? That's a bit harsh. I don't know if I would say that that's... Um, actually, I kind of agree with that. But I, I also think it's been... It's, it's, it's looking at the problem incorrectly because this question, this issue, is brought up... I've heard it brought up very often in this same kind of discussion and in the policy discussions of, okay, how are we going to do, how are we going to counter their information? We don't even know who we're about. But that's, I think, going back to the point of telling your story. What are you trying to tell? Yeah. It's not America is a homogeneous single society and here's the, the common ideas. In fact, if we go back to older times, um, those differences were exploited. Exploited is kind of a harsh word. Uh, use, leverage, highlight it. So to take a somewhat extreme example, and this is an example I used with the uh, uh, MIS students today. Um, in the 50s, uh, the State Department uh, wanted to send Louis Armstrong, no relation, by the way, Louis Armstrong abroad <laughs> to engage abroad. And Louis Armstrong, who's black, said, no, I don't want to support the U.S. government. Uh, I'm not really happy with U.S. government policy for civil rights, toward me, and all that sort of stuff. And the State Department said, that's why we want to send you. That's why it's important. Because the fact that you can have this conversation abroad on government money, and we're not telling you what to do, and we're sending you there, is part of telling our story. And he went... He was not happy about telling him about the U.S. Uh, there were members of Congress, I believe it was, that said, yank his passport, don't send him abroad. You, but this was part of telling the story. In fact, um, there's a really interesting uh, element here is that the horrible state of U.S. civil rights in, through, you know, up in this period of time 
contributed to John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, and then President Johnson supporting civil rights legislation. Because what happened domestically was having an effect on U.S. foreign policy interests abroad. And so Kennedy and Johnson are like, we need to change, make a change to the civil rights stuff. You know, it's not to play on a phrase, an American phrase, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's not <laughs> it. The world. So Eisenhower in his foreign policy plank speech, first time he's running for president, says, um, what we say and do and what we fail to say and do will have an impact in other lands. That's true. And so there's a really interesting argument, and I think it's 100% valid, that so what story did we want to tell? You know, the, there were uh, members of Congress from the South and people in the South that probably said, that's not the story I want to tell. But this was part of what the U.S. was, was having this conversation. Mary Dudziak wrote a book, uh, Cold War Civil Rights. I'm sure there are probably by this time other books on this subject, but that was an excellent book that was making the argument of, of uh, the civil rights movement in the U.S. getting assisted by the foreign, in, because of the foreign policy realm. Of, yeah, of the, okay. Um, Looking at Voice of America on YouTube, their reach is non-existent. Have reforms bringing in younger media personnel been considered? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not there. Um, but you, what you're raising, I would be interested if the questioner is watching the English service. I was just going to say, I found it yesterday yeah. when I was prepping. It's, and that's not hard to find. So you can find it's the It's not broadcast. the issue of if they're watching it and what's the audience. The, so the issue I have with the English service is who is the target audience? And I had fought to keep the English service when I was on the board, but I feel like the English service is now aimed at the United States or at Americans, which is not the violation you think it is. In the legislation, the smith munt legislation, there is a non-compete clause. It is not the Fulbrightian view that USIA, Voice America, and all, Radio Free Europe and all this stuff is unfit for American consumption. He's the one that tainted the informational activities we do abroad as unfit for Americans. In fact, um, a senator in 19... So he, he amended the legislation, that smith Act in 1972, because he hated all these informational activities. He tried You're to shut down USIA. Talking about Fulbright. Senator Fulbright, the in Fulbright exchanges. He shut down... He was trying to kill USIA. He was trying to shut down VOA, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He said Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, VOA, were radios that should be given the rightful opportunity to take their place in the graveyard of Cold War relics in 1972. Um, somehow that does not make it into the Fulbright biographies. I've checked. In 1985... <laughs> it might, it's interesting, too, because um, people in the theater probably know, but some of our online audience might not know that that was very important in Munich because their headquarters were here. Oh, ah, Fulbright, yeah. Right. Oh, another well, important point would be until Fulbright got his Fulbright-Hayes legislation passed in 1961, which virtually eliminated the Munt name from exchanges, and Munt had, the Smith-Munt legislation was massively into exchanges. In fact, that was its roots. Fulbright scholars, whether going to the U.S. or coming or leaving the U.S., were dependent on Smith-Munt monies. Because Fulbright monies were only foreign monies. And so it could get a foreign scholar to the U.S., but couldn't deal with their expenditures in the U.S., transportation, scholarship, or tuition, books, and all that stuff. And they relied on smith Munt monies. So it's a really interesting thing, to, but that was a race. But anyway, the point is, is in 1985, a senator was closing the, quote, loophole of, of Fulbright's 72 Amendment so that USI material, VOA, Radio Free Europe, public diplomacy stuff, was actually exempt from Freedom of Information Act requests. So if that doesn't taint this material as propaganda, as unfit material, I'm not sure what does. And that goes also to the institutional barriers, because I'm still fighting that, and I help change the legislation and point out some of these issues. Um, this, that goes deep. We can have spend an entire hour plus on just that, that topic. But... The, v, the VOA YouTube, yeah, ultimately what I would say is that it's, there is a leadership issue there. Where are they spending their money? Now, it's entirely possible it costs them nothing because they're doing this product and they're just going to put it on YouTube. You can't assume that there's a massive expenditure. But then there's the question of, okay, what's the English purpose? 
Yeah. Is it special English, which is a simplified English and is the content aimed for non-Americans? Or is it essentially coded so that for you to understand what the story is about, you have to understand the US? In which case, is that a valid product? I've just been, I have a survey. How do I get rid of this survey? I don't want that. I want your questions. Um, there was a question. I, I've lost the questions. There was a question about ChatGPT and mm -hmm. um, how you see AI working into public diplomacy. That's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> but now I, gotta figure this out. I haven't looked into that. I know people that are involved around this informational stuff, public diplomacy, that are starting to look into it. I just had a brief conversation with somebody the other day about it. Um, First thought is the large language model that ChatGPT is based on may or may not have relevant content for answering the questions. Um, and so it may or may not be useful. It may, unattended, go in the wrong direction. So I'm thinking a little bit about Microsoft's AI bot a while ago that went hardcore racist after being left unattended for a little bit. Um, so it depends, like with all things, how do you train it? So my dad, I've, I, I've been around computers really since the 70s before a guy named Bill Gates managed to get a deal with uh, a company called IBM because my dad was involved with computers early on. And he had this sign, whatever, in his office that said um, Something about the frustration with computers is that they don't do what you want them to. They only do what you tell them to do. And so this is an issue with ChatGPT. Okay. So ultimately, I think it's, it's still early to, to figure it out. But there's going to have to be parameters, just like with a person. You send a person out. You got to make sure they're going to stay in their lane to some degree and what they're going to communicate. I'm going to try to bundle two questions. Um, do you think Europe has stopped believing in the US, uh, given things like the rise of mass shootings, the Trump presidency, and the Capitol riots on January 6th? And even more, what grounds does the USA have to believe they know what's right for other countries? So on the first one, no, I, I can't answer whether believing uh, would the, all those activities form a kind of public diplomacy for the US? Absolutely because are they helping shape opinion of the United States? Absolutely, how do they not? And so that's negative PD. Um, um, do, people, do people in the position, in positions that can make changes care? Obviously not, we can see that. Because there are, uh, we keep seeing surveys that overwhelming number of Americans want to see change, and yet these people don't want to see change. Um, so, Another right here, Congressman moment? Yeah, I would say, <laughs> actually, no, I would say get, do, your, do what you can to get rid of gerrymandering so that, for example, representatives are, um, are accountable for their activities. Senators already are because they're statewide, but it's ultimately about gerrymandering. Uh, that's the first, first and primary thing. And then also local councils, whether it's state or county or something, and get involved in, in, in that space. Um, but problem is, you know, I gave the example of, say, Louis Armstrong. You don't have that same impetus because there's so, so many fires going on inside the house that the concern of the activity and the ability to ch check those fires, discuss those fires outside are severely limited. Um, I don't envy public diplomacy officers today and, and what they have to deal with with that. On the, um, the second part of that question was... It was a bit harsher. What grounds does the USA have to believe that they know what's right for other countries? Oh, yeah. I don't restrain that to now. I think that that goes back to telling our story, and that goes back to my point of what's democracy, and why do we say we want to promote democracy? It goes into a basic... What... There is... There is this pushing of ideals that is simply unnecessary. And it, again, it goes, back, it goes against the basic reasons of why we decided to engage abroad. All those quotes I gave you, they weren't about mirror imaging. 
It wasn't about creating mirror images, I should say. So we're not trying to create a bunch of little USAs? I didn't say that. Okay. We should not be trying to create a bunch of USA, little USAs. That was not the idea of creating a bunch of USAs, USAs. I think it sure seems like that in certain cases it is the let's create a bunch of USAs. But even that, that's not accurate. That's completely not accurate because the enemy of my enemy is my friend demonstrates that our principles are malleable and that is another policy that communicates. And so we, where are the principles? And some of these are they're hard choices to make because you have to go in this direction, you have to go in that direction. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. So but I'm not sh I don't agree that that's necessarily what we're trying to do. Do you think there's a need for a new USIA? Huh. No. <laughs> um, I'm a hard no on that. In fact, the people that are singing that chorus typically, if not always, have no idea what USIA actually was and what it did. And they imagine it did something that it didn't do. Now, that's not to say it was not a good agency and it didn't do good things, but it wasn't what they did. In fact, it was nice, I'm pointing as if the Gates article is on the screen, it's not, sorry about that. It's nice that Gates acknowledged, let's not recreate USIA. But um, you still have people, this chorus is still singing, I keep hearing this, this has happening within the Defense Department and other places, and they don't know what it is, what it was, and what they imagine, the f basis of that argument is if we only have the right organizational chart, that will magically manifest leadership, strategy, purpose, and thus be effective. But we have people in place. There's the undersecretary position. There are a bunch of other people in place. Why can't we have strategy now? There is a president. There is a National Security Council. So there are ways they can do this. They don't need to create a separate agency. And again, even, even the... So I wrote a response to the Gates piece, and I pointed out that the recommendations to create USIA were never fulfilled. And interestingly, most of the recommendations of we need a new USIA and it should look like this, oftentimes they look like the original recommendations that were never, ever fulfilled. Like there was one, one recommendation was it should look like the CIA in terms of the organizational chart. It's, so it's a separate agency and it's, a ta and it's directly, another one was it needs to be a cabinet member. And that's never what it was. And the other point is, so the Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy, established in 1999, oversees a smaller portfolio, has fewer authorities within the State Department and the interagency relations, um, fewer resources, then did USIA, although USIA didn't have authority over the State Department uh, activities. But the USIA director oversaw a smaller portfolio, had fewer resources than the entity, the agency it replaced. And so we kept shrinking. And USIA was a segregation of information from policy. It was the ultimate representation of that. And it appears that Russia and China are running circles around us. That's because we don't, we're not acting, we don't know what we want tomorrow to look like. We don't, we're not supporting our information activities. We under-resource them. We have people in this space. We're not supporting them. We're not giving them the resources. We're not hiring enough people. So it, just part of the example is that the people on the ground are the public affairs officers at the consulate and the embassies. Um, that's just part of it. But allegedly, the U.S. has been in some kind of information war for 20 years. Not only do we not have the foreign service officers, the number of foreign service officers have, gone, have not gone up but these information officers have not gone up. So we're not resourcing these people. We're not providing them the tools. Yeah. So how effective are we going to be? Plus, we don't integrate the informational element to policy. So we're not anticipating what's the other side gonna do. There are great things that happen, but those are the exceptions. For example, prior to the second invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the US came out and said, hey, Russia's gonna do this false flag operation. That was great how they did that. There were some missteps during it, but it was a great thing. But that was an exception. You don't have this institutional activity and this institutional support. That definitely is something that gives hope, though, because it really was well managed. Yeah, 
It's, it shows that we have the ability. To do it yeah. where there's a will. We can. We just don't have the support. Okay. A bunch of people are asking, what's the difference between tapping into soft power like Hollywood movies depicting American life um, and proper information warfare, and can they be blended? They could, but what's interesting is um, Hollywood, quote unquote Hollywood, right? That shorthand. Because of course, none of the production companies are really in Hollywood, I think, um, or the studios are. Um, they are increasingly, or have been, I'm, I, I, I'm certain things have changed in the last few years, but they were increasingly looking at China as a marketplace, which is a really interesting mm -hmm. idea because there was this thinking that Hollywood is supporting the U.S. Because 50 years ago, Hollywood was making movies fully within the U.S. image and supporting the U.S. image and pushing it abroad and all this stuff. And, and even that's not true, but generalization. And we had Hollywood focusing more on the Chinese market. And you had China in several movies, China coming in as the rescue, as the white knight. And I have said for a few years that I was waiting, I'm waiting, and I, I don't think this is going to happen anymore because of the relations with China um, have, have uh, declined. But I was waiting for the movie supported by the Ch a Chinese production company or something that, uh, that had the Chinese government rescuing the American people from a rogue CIA or other thing. That was completely plausible. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a script sitting out there for that. So you have the private enterprise and the government has some ability to influence but we don't really want that to happen. And we, I don't think we need it to happen. And that's part of the freedom. And besides, VOA, for example, can make a film. And, you know, if that film is really bad and jingoistic, then VOA should get rightly slapped and told, this is not within your mandate. And that would mm -hmm. be an oversight function. So that should, VOA does very good journalism. Um, and they need to be uh, supported in that sense. So this gets into what do you want to do, but ultimately the Hollywood side is, um, you know, it's private actor. Private actor. Yeah. Which also, actually, another question is about online, U.S.-based online platforms, as well as the regulation of online platforms and the role that that plays in all of this. Yeah. U.S.-based, that would be Facebook, I'm assuming, Twitter. Twitter. I suppose so, yeah, the social media platforms, because not, probably not talking about V Contactee or QQ TikTok or... TikTok is... Yeah. Um, I don't know the question. What can the U.S. do to manipulate that? To regulate. Oh, to regulate? I would go with data privacy, but I'm not an expert in that area, so all I'm going to say is Americans need more data privacy, data protection, sorry, data protection yeah. laws. Those of us here who get slammed with data protection buttons all day long are sort of up to here with it, but it is something that's good. Yeah, imagine not having that. Yeah. I will think, I will think of you now as I swear, and I'm trying to get, to my, get into my bank account with my you know, foot and hand. Um, what policy could be implemented today to improve USA Info outreach? That's a pretty broad question. We're getting close to closing. So that... I would start with leadership. I don't, I don't think it's a policy issue. I would start with leadership and I would, I would support activities, I would backstop people. Uh, one thing I have not mentioned that is critical is risk tolerance. This is a problem with government actors. Do you tolerate any risk? Do you tolerate making a mistake? People don't want to make a mistake. It can end their career, they can be punished, all sorts of things. They've got jobs, they've got families to support. They don't want to lose the job. So you need to be tolerant of risk. So one of the things that's really interesting about, say, Russian activities, more so than, than Chinese, is they'll throw seven narratives out. They'll see what sticks, they'll tweak it, maybe they'll keep five up. <laughs> they're, they're maybe even contradictory, it doesn't matter, they still got audience for each one. They tolerate the risk, and they will reiterate these messages, and they'll change it, and they'll be dynamic. Now, of course, they don't have to rely on being truthful or anything like that, just so, so that gives them additional flexibility. But how do you respond? You, how do you act in this space? You have to enable officers, um, and when I'm saying officers, I was meaning like foreign service officers, but anybody, you have to enable the people at the keyboard, the people at the microphones, the people developing these programs, you have to backstop them and support them so that they can take risks. You don't take risks 
you're often going to be reactive by definition. And we need to be proactive, we need to be preemptive, and if we can't take risks, we're not going to do that. And, that's, and that falls into the leadership umbrella. There's really no leadership here. The people are there, the positions are there, like the undersecretary is potentially the chief international information officer or chief international engagement officer for the U.S. government because it's an undersecretary within the foreign ministry. But that's not who they've hired for these positions. That is not who they've held accountable. That's, um, not, who they've, that's not how they've charged those positions to, to act. So like, several undersecretaries, when they were underperforming, the secretary just said, eh, okay, we'll just, we'll just leave you, ignore you because I can operate without you. That's a leadership problem. Look, one of my criticisms of the of the there I'm going to do it again. The Gates op-ed is. I think I should post this on our website. I'll post it so y'all can see. It. <laughs> one of the problems of the Gates article uh, op-ed is, you know, the president should do something about this. Okay, we're two years into the administration. There is no reason, absolutely no reason, this position hasn't been filled already. Now, they had a Foreign Service officer in that position for 435 days, which is a pretty good length of time, considering the Foreign Service officer, this is what they do for their job. Um, no, there were two Foreign Service officers, by the way, that were USIA directors. Never has there, there been a Foreign Service officer nominated and confirmed to be the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy because they conceive of the position in a different, different sort of way. So Colin Powell, for example, the Undersecretary that he brought on, he brought her on to do domestic rebranding of the State Department. His famous quote about that was, about that hire, was she was able to sell me Uncle Ben's brown rice, so she'll do a great job. Yeah, it's, it's funny, but it's, it, his mindset was domestic branding, rebranding of the foreign ministry, right? It wasn't about going abroad. And her, her, her appointment, her nomination, languished in the Senate mm. until 9-11. They didn't Boom. Like okay, the brown now rice. we have something. They didn't care. Okay. So this goes into who cares about this stuff? So the current nominee, the president has nominated somebody, I forget how long ago the person was nominated. Maybe it's just weeks. Seems longer. Time goes slow sometimes. Um, Senate's still sitting. In fact, that was part of the Gates op ed was hey, Senate, act, act. move. Yeah. Do it. So this is just a leadership issue. Now, when that now there was a nominee. There were rumors of a nominee for that position early in the administration. I don't know who that nominee was. I don't know if it was, there were valid rumors. So I also don't know if that person pulled out or if they were kicked out, right? The vetting process said, no, you're not going to be this. Or if the nominee said, look, I need these assurances. You're going to support me in this way. And this. But there's a nominee now. There is a nominee, now, a nominee now who has so. been the acting since April of last year. Okay. Um, so it's a matter of also us exercising our responsibility in democracy and... Call the senator, the members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, because I... Actually, I don't know if... Okay. I don't know where it is. If the nomination is sitting with the Foreign Relations Committee or if they kicked it out to the whole Senate and now it's waiting for the Senate to vote. I, I don't know. I don't know that. Okay. But yeah, it's... But it ultimately to... is... Where's the impetus? So also, where's the administration? Now, I don't know if the administration is banging on the Senate to pass these members, and I don't know if there are um, members, uh, senators, that are blocking this nomination for whatever reason. And we've seen this happen on the armed services side. Um, I don't know that, and maybe that okay. is a reason. But since the Gates op-ed did not mention that, I'm guessing it's just languishing. Okay. So we can all respond to the Gates op-ed. I'll post it. I'll post it. Okay. We are, I know for people online, we are at over an hour. So I think this is probably a good place to close this portion of our evening. Um, I'd like to invite everybody, before we go, to join our community on our website, if you haven't already, dialoguesondemocracy.com. That just gets you in emails on our future events. And I will post a link to the Freedom Academy substack and to the famous op-ed. What about my <laughs> substack? <laughs> oh, and you, yeah, I can post. Well, all right, he has if a substack, If you're going to post too. to us, post, post to us. I will post your substack as well. They'll all go out. Then you can see my response to the uh, Gates uh, op-ed. There we go.
So we'll post all of that tomorrow. Watch the website. And uh, again, we are an all-volunteer operation, so we operate here because of the generous support of America House and because, because of you, our members. So I want to thank everybody very much who has contributed, especially the Meteor Foundation, um, for their willingness to support transatlantic and pro-democracy initiatives. And um, to any of you who have given, thank you. And if you like what we're doing, um, please consider including us in your philanthropy mix so we can keep doing it. So I'd like to thank Matt so much for coming. Um, to those online, I'd like to thank you so much for watching. And to everybody here, please stay for a glass of wine and we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.